I can do whatever you like to do. So, um, from GA to finished coating, and what is the response to the uh, inspector by Richard Jennings? The Richard is technical service manager at Yacht Super Yacht for the EU and specialty coatings for Axe and Abel are known that will be known to all of you. Earlier in his career, he was a marine based uh, paint and coating supervisor working for Sunseeker International with experience in application, estimating, project management. Richard is qualified as a registered weed coatings inspector, RMCI, through the program operated by the IMS and MSA, and he's one of 80 people who now hold that qualification. Um, we work very closely with Axon on this whole program, and I think the next hour, I think you're going to find actually quite illuminating. So without further ado, I should be sort of. Thanks, Mike. Well, morning, everyone. Um, so, that's, uh, that's taken my thunder, so Mike's done most of my introduction, so we will move on. <laughs> uh, I was going to do a welcome, you never know with those sort of things, but um, I normally go through my safety and fire alarms, but we won't do that today, we'll just go straight into it. So, what I've done today, that there's a lot involved um, in what we're talking about today. So what I'd like to do is give you the opportunity to choose the topics that you'd like to go into. Now, what I want to do is I want to cover the, the fundamentals of what we do as a paint inspector. So if you could just give me the time to go through maybe two or three of these topics and then we'll come back to them um, for you to be able to, to go into, to, to make it more relevant to your business or whatever you want to do. I appreciate I can't please everyone, but hopefully um, there's something in there for, for most of us to see. Um, now, so who am I? I might spin through that very, very quickly. I've been in the, I know I don't look like it if we make any comments, I've been in the industry for 30 years, um, was a, a painter and an applicator and a paint manager, um, now working with a, a paint company. Why did I do that? Probably to make my world bigger. Um, it's a big world out there and we tend, when you work with one yard or one particular area, you only know their ways and it's, it's quite uh, an eye opener when you go around the world to different yards to understand how yards can be different. Why do I mention that? Well, everything that we talked about this morning, there's been some sort of process involved with what we do. Um, and that really applies to our inspection as well. Um, why do I say that? Because wherever we go, Mike talks about leaving, leaving a, um, a good feeling, a reputation of what we do, what we're trying to achieve. And what we're trying to do is give some consistency within our industry. And if you get a paint surveyor, you're going to get the same sort of service. That's why RMCI has been developed. And we're starting to follow a process. But then we have to involve so many other things. There's paint companies, there's specifications. So it's really a journey through that and, and what we can expect. So the first thing, you know, what is paint? You know, a liquid material can be applied to the surface, dries and cures, works in the marine environment. That's simplified to us. To a customer, it can be everything. On a, externally, it can be the aesthetics, they're not really worried about anything else, but from a point of view of a surveyor, we need to make sure that every box has been ticked and every, everything has been checked. So there's managing the expectation of the owner or the owner's representative at the end. There's following a the specification, and there's the understanding of, and we talked about it earlier, of managing the expectation and actually what we should be left with and what we should achieve. Does that make sense? Am I going too quickly or is everyone, everyone's happy? Okay. So marine paint, if we require, um, you know, a lot of people will say paint is paint. Um, it is to a certain extent, but then we have different resins, we have different um, components that we use to make them more suited to certain environments. Hi, James. We're not copying, don't worry, I'm just You can tell by their faces, it's not that exciting. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it has, it has different, it has a different job to do. There are different things that a paint has to do. So as a surveyor, we need to understand that. So where do we start? Where, where do we start as a surveyor? And who are we involved with? There's a huge amount of people, we talked about this earlier, that um, we, we looked at the raising of, of, a, of a ship and the amount of people involved. We have that with the paint industry. 
um, you can have a yard. So the yard will have uh, a management team. You can have then a separate application that's running out of the yard. You've got the owner's representative. Now that can be a number of people. Um, and you've got a paint company representative. There should be someone there from a paint company and, and potentially a paint consultant as well. And, and I say potentially, you really should have someone at this stage. And that doesn't happen very often. And that's where fundamentally the job falls down. So if any of you are involved with surveying, you need to be there, particularly on the paint side, right from the start. Because this is where I call it grey areas. It's probably a very English term, but these are the areas that are very difficult to manage. So what, what does that mean? Well, we start with a pre-project meeting. Now the pre-project meeting, I'm going to show you some documentation. You don't have to have this documentation. It doesn't have to follow this exactly, but there is a process there and you'll understand what I mean by, by doing that. So we start with a pre-project meeting. Um, what does that look like? Well, one of the most important things is the project timeline. We talked about expectations earlier. What's the timeline of the projects? Um, we, we look at the coating specification. You know, we need to conform to a coating specification. As a surveyor, you need something that is measurable, that's tangible, that you can, you can work against. Otherwise, we've got all these people in this room, and if I ask you to assess I don't know, the paint finish or the, the, the finish on, on this pillar here, we're all going to have a different opinion. And there's always going to be one of us that's going to be, you know, pushing their opinion stronger and, and thinking that they're right. And the easiest way to manage that is by having a standard to work to, something measurable. Making sense? So, acceptance criteria. That's really, really important. So that needs to be agreed right at the start. Now. That, that can be um, a document that, that's written. Um, my, my suggestion, and we'll go into this further on, is probably that you even have an acceptance panel or something that you're dealing with. I know I'm predominantly talking about finishes at the moment. This is exteriors, but an acceptance panel, because the other issue you can come against is that the panel that's produced by the paint company in a, in a, a very beautiful paint facility by a lab assistant is very different to that finish that you might get in the particular yard that you're working at. So it needs to be something you can reproduce. So what I'm saying by that is that it's pointless having a panel produced for you in, in the most immaculate finish when you're unable to achieve that in the yard. And this is going back to managing expectations. Is, does this that I can do here match this your expectation over here? So this form, it's, it's a very uh, simple form, but it's very, very useful to use. And you've got a document right from the start of your project. So one of the key things was recording and storing your data right from the start of the project. Now, one of the main things that you're going to have, and I will just put one up here, the first thing that's going to make our job easier as an inspector is a specification. And what does that specification give you? Let's just go down. Let's make it make it simple. Um, so we're looking at this is an underwater area on a vessel. So it's stating um, what needs coating. Then we've got all the other areas in in there and what's expected. So we um, we've got the hull inside as a high performance spray. So this is basically saying what is expected. Once we have that list drawn up of what's expected, obviously then we have to have a product that aligns with that. And what is then done in most specifications is they will split out the different areas, whether it's tank coatings, interior, underwater, top sides, and you will have the relevant product and the data to go with that. So if you can see here, we've got an underwater section here. So starting at the top would be um, from your bare substrate and then you'd have your your coating uh, an epoxy coating a primer a tie coat going through to anti -foul. the thing good thing for us as a surveyor is it's got all the details on there it's got the dry film thickness that should be expected that's really really important for us when we're going to go in and do an inspection because okay you want me to inspect your underwater area 
but actually what what am i what am i looking for you know as a surveyor we can say that the the coating is fully coalesced it's it's gone on there really well but whether it's uh international Jotun, hempel whoever you're using what what should the product be applied to and what will give the, the customer their uh, their warranty at the end of it so this document's really important for us as a surveyor because we've got reference good afternoon kai good morning how are you i can see that you've not missed anything and that's it that's the end <laughs> um, so we can we can go into that i'm not going to go any more into that document um Another one is uh, it's quite poignant that um, Mr. Brader has turned up at this point. Um, another one is standards. I'm not going to go through this, but some paint companies or areas have, have written paint standards. Again, as a surveyor, your most important questions are, what's the specification and what's the standard? Because until you have those two documents, you are going to be fighting a losing battle. And I mean that very respectfully to owners, surveyors, whoever. You will lose that battle, whatever you do, unless you have a tangible document to work against. It's really, really important because this is a project that can change project management. It can even change application companies. It can even change paint companies going through the project. So the guy that signed the paperwork at the start of the project 12 months ago, he's gone. He's, he's been offered another 10 euros an hour and he's gone for another company. So that document is really, really important. Any questions at this point? No? Okay, so what are we missing? Are we missing anything? I might have given you some, uh, given you a clue. Considerations of what we're missing. So we've got a specification, we've got a standard. The only thing, anyone? No. Nope. I believe an acceptance panel and it, or an acceptance area that everything that's being asked for is achievable. We talked about managing expectations. This is the time to do this at the beginning of the project. Now, I will stress again what I mean. A, a shipyard, as you all know, is a very different environment to a, uh, a paint facility where a test panel has been supplied. So a customer says, I would like this color, please, Mr. Paint Company. Can you supply me a sample? The paint company spend hours making the most beautiful sample because they want their paint to be used. But then that really, really gives a problem to the application yard. And is it really possible to get that over a thousand square meters? You know, is that possible? So we're talking about an acceptance panel uh, done in the same facility or even an area on the vessel if, if it's a maintenance or refit, something like that. So you have tangible things and you have ways that you can measure against to say, this was agreed, this section was agreed acceptable. And if you've got any queries leading up to that, then you can measure against that. Now, the reason I say that is when you issue a non-conformance as a paint inspector, they will, I think, hate you is probably the word, very strongly. They will dislike you. So you talked about leaving a legacy or a memory. And non-conformance is a really good way of doing that when they've just uh, re-sprayed a thousand square meters and you say it doesn't conform to specification. So managing the expectation is important all the way through. We know what we need to do, we know what needs to be achieved, and we know how we're going to do it. So there are many ways of doing that. i uh, just show you a quick way that I do that. I even work to a um, 25 square decimeters on a, on a panel um, where I can count dust inclusion, put wave scan details, all relevant information to say, this is what you can expect. And then that is used, it's dated, it's signed, and it's, it's stored as a, a, a reference for the future. So when your new surveyor comes along and he wants to make a reputation for himself, and he wants to say how badly it's been painted and how awful paintwork is, you have something to reference it against. <coughs> so, what do we need knowledge of? Marine paints and paint systems. That, that's basically what we need the knowledge of um, and an understanding of those. And, you know, the right product for the right job. 
that's what we're talking about. Is the, is the product suitable for exterior? Is it interior? Is it uh, an epoxy? Is it a tank coating? So it's understanding the products that we're using. Okay. So this is, you know, what I thought I added this bit in, because then I thought, why? Why do we need to know all of that? Because that's your customer. He doesn't know any of this. He doesn't care that you've had years of experience and you've got loads of qualifications. Why? So he's going to say, so what? I just want it to look shiny and pretty. You're going to need to know about the, the consequence of the paint faults and the imperfections and how to correct them and what would be the solution. And now I've got to say, and this, this is what I'm known for, Mike. You can make it 90% better or you can make it 90% worse. Okay, so as soon as you pull that trigger again, you can make it 90% better or you can make it 90% worse. It's a gamble. This is managing expectations. So if I've painted this whole side of this ring and my specification says I'm not allowed any more than five dust inclusions in this square decimeter and I've got six here, and all that's perfect, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? Doesn't conform, does it? But what's the potential risk of painting that all again? All dust inclusions, tape lines, all these things. So we still have to have the air of flexibility as a surveyor. We can say that this doesn't conform to specification. It doesn't mean it won't be painted again, but we, can, we certainly need to, to have our document in line to say, this doesn't conform, but you're, you know, you'll have a meeting on those sort of things. We, we, still have to have, we still have to be sensible, but it's the decision of the yacht owner or the owner's representative. We are not there to make that decision. We are there to deal with fact, and that's all we can deal with. And what's the fact? It's the specification and the, the quality that we're working to. And if it doesn't fall within that, it's a non-conformance. There may be a conversation after that that involves very different people that we may have to be involved with as a surveyor, but we, we have to be careful of those areas, because it's, uh, just remember that, 90% worse, 90% better. And I think you know what I mean by that. You know, you can paint it, if you paint it once and it goes wrong, you're gonna paint it three times. Never goes right the second time, in my experience. So, we will need to be able to identify faults commonly found in paintwork, um, how to define and describe commonly found faults in paintwork. There's lots of terminology out there. I can probably help you with that. Uh, there's a, there's a, a thing called a fix atlas. Most of you have probably heard of the fix atlas, but it, it's, um, it's paint speak. It's been written and it talks about pinholes, fish eyes, all these sort of things to help you identify a problem that you're looking on a vessel. So at least you can have the right terminology when you're dealing with it. Because these can get confused in, in, a, in a phone call to you to say that this boat's full of dimples. Um, but actually when you go to it, it's full of fish eyes. Those are two different faults, but they can look quite similar. So from our point of view as, as surveyors, we need to have an understanding of what we're looking at and how that can be resolved. So, I'm going to now, I think we all know why we paint. You know, it's, it's, it, it's really, there's two things, there's aesthetics, but for the owner, but mainly from our point of view, it's the longevity of, of that product, to, to give that product a longer life. And we need to pick the right products to be able to do that. So we have many, many different coatings and systems to do that. Um, so as I say, it's the aesthetics, ease of maintenance, um, and there's lots of factors that affect the finish. How are we doing the time? We're nearly there, and then you can choose. Um, we're still talking uh, exterior finishes at the moment. One of the main things is fairness. Um, I won't use my usual terminology, it's not quite that polite, but there's certain things in life you can't polish. Um, if there's lots of deviations, but you can roll it in glitter. Anyone that's English may know what I'm talking about. Um, but what I mean by that, if it, the, the 
project isn't fair and good, then that's always going to telegraph back through and show through to the surface finish. So the preparation is key. Um, we talk, there's a lot of emphasis on painters and who's the best painter and painters like to be the best. But actually, you know, I put my investment into the, uh, into the people prepping because the, the prep is where, where the work is. And that's where we need to be when we're doing our inspections. If you go and do the top coat, you're too late. You, you need to make sure that going through the process, everything is right leading up to that top coat reshoot. Um, you know what the five main factors we've said that um, so we've got I think the one previously um, we were talking about fairness you get sanding marks you get contamination we're still talking top coats at the moment uh, this is a very much a very low DOI distinction of image no not very good reflection um, you get orange bill you get bits in the paints so gloss levels but all of this, all of this is, can go back to your original specification. There will be figures in there for when you run a wave scan over there, what you should have for orange pill, what you should have for DOI, what you should have for gloss. And what, what does this do? It protects everyone. It, it gives the, the applicator the understanding they know what they've got to achieve. It gives the surveyor the confidence in delivering the message if it conforms or doesn't conform. And it's, it's not an opinion-based thing. It's purely on, on facts and figures, which is really important because it can get very emotional. So if you've got that document trail to say, this is what I should be looking at orange pill wise, um, does it or doesn't it conform? There may even be agreed at the start a percentage of, of lenience of, uh, you know, within 5% plus or minus, that that can be written in there. We've got, um, so pro probably one of the things I wanted to put on there is that we've gone through what it, what it means, but what does it actually mean to the owner or the person at the end paying the bill? On a super yacht, uh, you're looking at 25 hours per meter squared as a cost um, from substrate up. Now we're looking at maybe 60 euros an hour for a European yard to build. So it gives you an idea of how, how much you know, these things cost. So the importance of being there right at the start and, and holding people's hands through the process is, is a good one. Um, and it's really simple. What are we looking at? We're looking at primers, undercoats, and top coats. So what I wanna do is go back just to, to one section that I think is really really important and we'll go from this slide here and one of them I, I'm going to go into just before you get your choice is your reports now uh, you can talk to Mike and Hillary on this because we're, we're in conversations about things at the moment on report system I know Kai's working on on similar sort of things as well um, what I have a short uh, point I think what is also to, what we also have to put in account is uh, if we have reference panels, it's one thing. The other thing is to be sure that we get the process right monitored is that we have on board in the time of the building with the material is available, with the guys, with the tools, the reference area on board. Yep. And this area should get it, if we have a new build, it should get sandblasted, it should get primed, fitted and paired, and top coat. Yeah. And why? The thing is, later, after half a year or a year, if we, have, uh, if we start to discuss the quality, and the quality will get dramatically down, whatever quality is, shrinkage, all the things we have to put in account, yeah. and this will change the surface dramatically. That means, in the end of the day, if we have a reference area, the reference area aged in the same way the whole boat aged, then it's okay. Yeah. Because the painter can't, uh, for the painter, it's uh, only uh, possible to deliver what he gets from you as a paint manufacturer and so on. Oh, and I'm a surveyor today. <laughs> okay, <laughs> because I see so much Axel. So. Uh, Okay. I can only deal with reports I've written. Okay. So that, what, what, we, what we have to, to look for is uh, 
very clear. No, very we, clear. And we, we did touch on that before you came in. So we talked about we talked about pre-project meetings, reference areas no, and panels. Exactly, but the timeline is important. That's on there as well. The timeline. You turned up on time. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> no, Kai, we, we said that earlier. We talked about the, the pre-project meeting goes through timeline. That timeline also includes expected delivery times of products. Um, and, and also, we didn't touch on that, but hold points as well. It's very important for you as a surveyor that you agree on the hold points. The hold points are where the project will stop, where you come in and, and look at the vessel. And that needs agreeing because you, I, I can't name companies, but I deal with one company that builds 300 boats a year. And there are 10 hold points on every boat that they do. That means, I'm not very good at maths, but that's a lot, 3,000 visits. I can't do 3,000 visits. So what we did, we wrote an audit form and we, we, we checked those 10 points on different boats along the production line. So it gave us an overview of, of how it was working. Um, so sometimes you have, to, you have to work smarter. We're talking about, you want lots of clients, you can't put all your, uh, sorry, keep using English sayings, you can't put all your eggs in one basket. I mean, you can't just aim for one, one big OEM. You need lots of businesses to keep you running. The big OEMs don't pay you on 90 days, then you become insolvent. So you need, you need to be clever. And, and one of those ways is producing uh, an inspection where you inspect the production line rather than the individual boats. So this, that was also developed. So that's also worth bearing in mind. You can, if, you're, if you start to go into big uh, OEMs or where you've got multiple vessels to look at, if you've agreed those 10 hold points, it doesn't mean you have to do those 10 hold points on one vessel. You can walk the production line and you're, you're auditing the, the business and you can just give a non-conformance from that, that vessel. And quality is their issue. Don't, you know, never get involved with quality. That's not your job. Quality is, is to do with the yard that's building the boat. And, and having an opinion can be dangerous. This is why that acceptance panel and everything that you have is really, really important. But what I wanted to show you very, very quickly is, is how simple this, um, this form has been developed actually on, on an iPad. So you write it there and then when you're, you're at the vessel. <coughs> you can take photos there and then. And I'm finding that yards are very accepting for anyone that's got any questions on can you take a camera or um, an iPhone into a yard. Th these, this is all, this is actually... Um, in, in Holland, this is FedShip, where I've, I've done some inspections for them and they're very accommodating and I'll tell you why. Mike said, how quickly can I have that report? You can have it the same day with, with this because it's live and the interesting thing, if you can produce a live report, you can also get some buy-in from whoever the charge hand is that's walking the boat with you. It's live, they're seeing it done, they're seeing it reported and it makes your life a lot easier. So if there is a non-conformance, they know about it, they act on it, and you know everyone knows what they need to do. Um, it's not really important what I'm, what I'm showing you. Um, it's just that you, you can record certain areas, film thicknesses. The, the point I'm trying to make here is that recording is really, really important because you will have forgotten in six months time as good as you think your memory is, you will have forgotten the important things. One of the key things on that boat was a leaking, um, it's got a remote uh, station on the side at the, up on the top deck, so it can be driven by a joystick, so the, the um, captain can see what he's doing. That was leaking, that leaked throughout the project. And throughout the project, they had contamination issues on the lower deck. So, Making notes of those sort of things are really, really important for, for you just to protect everyone involved in that. And if they choose not to repair it, it's not your issue, but you've noticed it. Any questions at this point? No? <coughs> okay, so this is, uh, this is where we have a little bit of participation. This is where we all have to wake up and have a look now. So what we've done We've looked at the introduction of where to start as a surveyor. Um, typical top coat systems, we touched on that really, really briefly. And then we've looked at um, the, the report side and how important that is. So what I've got, um, 
I've got mail bits you can choose from to, to fill it. We've got how long have we got, Mike? Half an hour. Got half an hour. So we can look at um, application of fillers, spray methods, corrosion protection, anti fouling, foul relief systems, tank coatings, um, properties of paint, preparation, measuring and keeping records. So that becomes that's a little bit more detailed in using wave scans, those sort of things. Um, and troubleshooting. Now the troubleshooting, the main one with that, it's talking about these defects that you might see, what they look like. So I'm gonna do it by a show of hands and I'm gonna be diplomatic if I can be. So is anyone interested in fillers? That's easy, that's a no. Spray methods? Yeah. Okay, a couple on spray methods. Um, corrosion and protection. Okay, that's a strong one. Uh, anti fouling three on there, uh, foul release coatings, nothing on there, tank coatings, a couple on there, properties of paint, no, preparation, measuring keeping records, it's a fairly strong one as well, and troubleshooting. Okay, troubleshooting strong and corrosion is strong, so we'll start with those two, everyone's happy with that? And then we'll drop back into the others. We had a few with sort of two or three hands up. We'll drop back into those. So corrosion and protection. I'm not going to go into the full NACE side of things and, um, and what it's all about. This is really going to disappoint you now. That looked really professional, didn't it? And now we're going to see how much content there is. Probably not loads, but there's going to be a couple of bits in here that you might want to argue with. And I'm happy with that because it's, it's about everyone being involved. Um, corrosion protection. Okay, so what are we saying? I love the start of this, unfortunately. It's a great word. I'm sorry, but it's very English. We start by apologizing. I don't know if you've noticed that with any, anyone that's not from England. An Englishman will always start by apologizing. Then he will go for the jugular. <laughs> unfortunately, even painted surfaces are not immune to corrosion because uh, water and oxygen can always penetrate a layer to some degree. Now I'm gonna, there's a bit of osmosis on here, because we this is where everyone argues with me, but you can get osmosis within the paint surface as well, because mm -hmm. it's, you can get little osmotic blisters, those sort of things. And you see it many times. And we, we see it a lot, we do see it a lot, it, and it's normally where something isn't dried or something's laid over the top, um, where something's covered. Mm -hmm. I can only talk about the world I'm involved with, but they put deck bathers down, all those sort of things on a wet surface. And then you get this, my paint's bubbling and blistered. You know, it, it, is, it is possible. I could do it, I could do it on your car bonnet. If I put a wet towel on your car bonnet for a few days, and I've offered to do this to quite a few surveyors over the years, when I was on the other side of the fence, um, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna cause a problem. So why am I saying that? You know, the, the adhesion of the paint to the surface in this situation is, is, is the wet adhesion, and that's critical. How the, the, how the two products come together is <coughs> critical. Just very quickly, for those of you who have done NACE or Frazier or anything like that, what, what, what causes corrosion? What are the elements of, of corrosion? Oxygen. Oxygen. Moisture. Moisture. So how do we stop corrosion? The we, we want to remove one or all of those. That is fundamentally all you need to do. We need to remove one or all of those things. So I was, I was um, the, the, your previous, really, really interesting to me, because how many people looked at that and went, oh, a year that it was underwater, best place it could be. Why? Oxygen. Yeah, there's no oxygen getting to it. So, you know, it's the best place that vessel could be. The first thing to do was, it was to manage the expectation, manage the, the repair team, getting them in, because as soon as that ships up and the oxygen's getting to that moisture, you're in trouble. So that's, you know, I just wanted to touch on that. It's really nice sometimes when these presentations all fall into place, but what you've done is you've limited the oxygen getting to the wetted area on that vessel, therefore you've limited the corrosion. Probably you'd have seen it on the top decks, would have been the worst place because that's, that's getting wet, drying, getting wet, drying, exposed to oxygen. So nine times out of 10, leave it under. So 
so wet adhesion, when we talk about that, it's, um, it's, it's getting the paint to lay down everywhere on, on there. And, and the most difficult side thing is where there are strengtheners and stringers and all those sort of things on a vessel. And it's, we talk about stripe coating, we talk about spraying. You know, stripe coating is normally done in areas where it's difficult to spray. That's to get the product in there. We've really got to look at the shape and understand. And why am I talking about this as a surveyor? Well, the bit that we're most interested in is on all of this webbing, these areas and the paint film thickness on those webbings. Is there enough there? There has to be enough product to stop the corrosion coming. It can be colored, looks like a red oxide type of product on there. But if there's only 20 microns on there, it's not really gonna have any great effect. So you're then, there's, there's another thing to bear in mind in all of this on these paint schemes. The first products you're putting down, it's not just about corrosion, it's also about adhesion because it's holding whatever you're putting on top of it. So what I mean by that is that if you're in a fully filled and fed vessel, you're gonna hang a lot of product off of that corrosion inhibiting product at the start of the scheme. So you're, you're gonna go, uh, corrosion then you're going to go fillers then you're going to go primers and top coat and you know i've seen I don't know how many people get involved with filled and fed vessels but filler can kite it can vary on it massively yeah. <coughs> so we need to make sure there's the right amount of products on there and the, the difference between a good product release is some hundred percent of adhesion failure. yeah and that means uh, what what we see in the on board is most of the cracks we see they're based on a very poor adhesion. Yeah. And yeah. you are completely right. It's yeah. Exactly so very poor what you can do is you can have, and then people say that you do a dolly test where you glue on a dolly onto the onto the surface and you, you do a pull off test and it will record the how much pressure is you know it takes to pull this dolly off and every every product will have a figure. So the paint companies will be able to give you some guidance on on what is good and what isn't. Why that's important, if you get involved with something that's got a corrosion on it and you go into a, a refit procedure, you need to get back to a point where that um, existing underlying coating is sufficient to hold the new coatings that you're gonna put on there. Does that make sense? So you're gonna to have to do these dolly tests until the point where you're getting the, the MPA reading of maybe five megapascal, something like that, and then you're safe so it's going to give you an idea of how far your, your corrosion goes back. Because when we talk about corrosion, it isn't just the look of rust, it's the effect it has on the product around it. So you, it can weaken the, the integrity of the coating and then you'll get flaking, those sort of things. Um, we, we have many tests that you can do. If we're talking corrosion and tanks, one of the ones that you may have seen is that as soon as they put a tank coating on, they'll fill the tank with water. To fill the tank with water and drain the tank and it will be left you, you will leave the tank maybe minimum 24 hours maximum maybe 48 hours you'll drain it and then you will be looking for rust little bleeds to see if there's any porosity in the coatings so when you're in tanks there are tests that you can do to make sure that you've got a, a fully coalesced and, and coated tank on there so you know it's it's quite simple but it, it's very effective it's just looking for for bleeding rust through pinholes. The point of this slide, um, what it's really saying is that in practice, despite the best preparation, there's no such thing as 100% corrosion prevention. Everything is permeable. There's a, a way that the product's gonna get through, but what, what this is showing in a very simplified way, it looks like a brick wall, but it's in the, the coatings, the more coatings that you're putting on there and how you build the scheme will give you the protection. So if you have um, you know, any pinholes or anything when you're going through, then you're gonna to need to seal those and, and recoat. So the important thing on there, it really is, is eliminating those two things, it's moisture or air. So the, the thickness of the paint is very, very important on this um, because of, of the penetration getting through there. So, Therefore, the optimum corrosion protection for the coating can be obtained by applying several coats. Now, that will be going back to your specification. Probably one of the easiest ones to explain that on is um, 
underwater areas. So this is something where anti-fouls on whether it's on um, container ships or or, or power boats, it's uh, something that wears that, that wears away. So really, you need to know the sea miles of that vessel, what's expected, to know how much coating you're going to want to put on there. You can't really take a guess at it. Um, a nice and lovely little tip. It's a very simple thing, but with your first coat, do it in a different colour because it gives you a visual prompt is, is when that, that scheme is, is worn down. What I mean by that is that if you've got a black fouling that you finish it with, if you make the first coat red and it's a, a wearable product, as soon as you start to see uh, it, it blushing through in red, you know that your coating is expired because, again, captains, people change and they don't really know how many sea miles it's done. So there, there are a lot of, there's a lot of good things we can do as a surveyor to, to help. And we're talking about leaving a reputation. You know, be useful, be helpful. Opinion's dangerous, but being helpful is, is a good thing. And, and that's a really difficult line not to cross. Um, your, job, you, your job isn't to have an opinion, it's to state the facts. But it's really good to have a, a resolve of, through an issue that you may have seen. That, that's what's going to make you stand out. And the more you do, the more you'll see, and the easier it will become. So, um, walls and transport. This is this is how how the the rust goes in. This is all pretty obvious stuff, but it's good to see it in the schematic on there. This is where you've got a, a, a pinhole or, or something, or the the other side is showing the flake where you've got the the, the painted surface lifting. So, what it's allowing is the the water to penetrate through un unto the, the substrate on there. So, you know, most of it is either going to be adhesion from your coating, the thickness of your coating, or a defect in the coating. Does that make sense on, on anything that you do? And obviously one thing that's worth talking about is obviously your blasting initially. You need to blast it back to clean SA2 and a half, something like that. Um, but then you're going to need to get a coating on there very, very quickly, because what's the first thing that's going to happen? It's going to start to oxidize. And, that, and that's that's a form of corrosion. So, and then if it oxidizes and you put a coating on, then your coating's not really sticking to anything. So it's it's finding those windows and that environmental the environmental condition is probably your most important thing after blasting to first coat of, of coating on there. I think we have to put in mind that if we have less than fifty percent humidity, humidity in the air, yeah, yeah, then we don't have this problem so that's why how we can fit and or climb yep. and fit and fit the super yacht so we look for that we get a very dry environment and completely right what you're saying yeah this is a very very important thing and what you also should add fit on it is if you have a used boat and you sand blast it and it's important that you have an eye on the yeah so well used boats as well then, then you've got to talk about moisture content as well you know we have to be realistic you know you're going to have if you've got below maybe 12 percent moisture you're going to be okay to paint with it within that substrate it's never going to be 100 percent dry and don't take your moisture readings just after they jet washed it i've seen it so many times it's washed and it's like oh moisture's high it's like yeah it's just it's just been hit actually one of the best ways to to dry it is uh steam cleaner actually get them to steam clean it rather than jet wash it because it, it acts as a, as a dryer as well. Um, so epoxy, this is why we use epoxies. Epoxies and polyurethane coatings are totally impervious to ion transport through the bulk polymer. This is the nerdy bit of the paint side. Um, so the ions, they can only pass through a physical defect. So that's a pinhole, flaking, detachment, whatever it may be. I'm not going to go massively into that, um, but it, you're looking at the same thing. You're looking at detachment or a pinhole. But, you know, what's the common theme in this, really? What, what are we looking for? We're just looking for a good coating, a, a good sound coating that, that's stuck. That's what we're looking for as a surveyor. Um, these are all consequences of, of something. So we've got to look at failure mechanisms up here, blistering. Um, you know, the blistering, you get your osmotic blisters on there where water's passing through. Um, two millimetre, you know, I've seen them quite a bit bigger than that. Um, 
Electrolysis, that's another interesting one actually. When you've got stray current on a vessel, they can actually push the coating off. Um, so the quickest way to know the difference between those two blisters is if it's an osmotic one, if you break it, it'll have a sort of vinegary smell to it. Um, but with, uh, if it's a discharge of current where the current is pushing the paint off, it will be immaculately clean, immaculately clean, really bright, shiny metal. Um, but where it's blistered and it pushes it off, it's a really simple, a simple one. You can get that if you put too many anodes on that. You can, you can, a and a lot of lot of marinas with poorly um, managed boats on there with power hookups. You know, some of some of the, the waters I wouldn't even swim in when you look at the discharge back through the water. But yeah, through those two blisters, a really good way. Osmotic ones are slightly vinegary, and you smell them. Um, if it's come from electrolysis, it'll be a beautifully clean patch of steel that you see underneath. And you can see that a lot. If you ever get involved with smaller crafts, um, you, you know, that's one of the things you'll get called in for. My boat's got osmosis and, you know, all over it. And you go, actually, do you know what? Who fitted the, uh, you know, who fitted the electronics? It's wet. And um, <laughs> I had it on a window, weirdly, around the window where the paint wouldn't stay on it. And, and the guy had screwed through an electrical lead. Didn't, didn't break it, didn't short it out, but he'd gone through the wiring harness and thrown through the boat. And it, just broken through, so it was, it was pushing the coating off on this in this certain area, and it was uh, electrolysis. <coughs> so we talked about that quickly. I'm very mindful we pick some other some other subjects. So um, we're talking about cathodic blisters, those sort of things. Uh, pH, as you know, that's one one for testing. We're looking at your pH levels, acidic or or alkali, those sort of things. There's lots of, there's litmus papers, things that we can use to do our testing. Um, there are, in fact, everything that you do, there is going to be a standard against it. So research it. If you've gone through the training, you will really know where to go, but there'll be an ISO or some sort of standard against what you're looking at. So salt tests, um, all those sort of things. There is there is a process, and that goes back to me right at the beginning to say there's a process for everything. There's a, there's a process to protect you and all your customers in whatever you do. And I mean protect because when you start to give your opinion, that's when it, it's hard because it becomes your thought against someone else. If you can make it a tangible thing against figures and this is what it should be, this is what it is, maybe <coughs> that it's different, but the decision is made to keep it, but you've had that conversation. Cold wall blistering. Um, that's when it comes to, uh, you know, hot, moist air comes into contact with paint or film on cold steel. Uh, uh, you know, there is a big cold surface there. You get warm air on it. You've seen the moisture. We talk about dew point all the time. That's really important, you know, the, the dew point before you paint. But one of the biggest things is getting rid of moisture. Um, and when do we all paint, you know? I, I have this conversation a lot. People talk about within three degrees of the dew point. Yes, but rising rising within three degrees of the dew point. Because if you're sending your paint crew in at eight o'clock at night and the dew point is four, it's dropping. So you could potentially give yourself an issue with blooming or detachment or something like that. So as a paint surveyor, if you're going in and your figures will look right. So this is that point of making yourself stand out from the rest. You haven't just gone, okay, it's four degrees, it's fine. You've actually gone, you know what guys, it's four degrees but we're falling, you know, we, we need to stop this. Because on paper, on paper, that job was correct. But in, in three hours time, in a six hour paint shoot, that's gonna drop to a level that potentially might have a coating issue for you in the future. We just need to be aware of, of all of these sort of things. Aluminium. I guess you guys get involved with aluminium quite a lot as well. Oxidation is probably the key thing. It reacts so, so quickly, aluminium. So when we talk about blasting and putting the coating on, it's as Kai said, as much as we can control the environment. We can extend our times if we can control the environment. You know, if there's no moisture in the air, we don't have to get a coating on there quickly. So we can manage our time. But if, if there's moisture in the air, then we need to get that coating on there quickly. 
So it might be that you have to plan the project that you're doing sections at a time. It's not ideal, but you're, you're controlling the coating that's going on there. So if you have good control of your environment, yes, you can extend your overcoat windows because you've got, you've eliminated one of the, the two key attributes of the corrosion, one being moisture. Again, it's, it's, the, it's the same message all the way through, actually, you know, um, still again, the, the key thing is, is to control your moisture, good preparation, and get your products on there to the right, the right thickness. Are we happy with that part of corrosion? Should we move into something else? Seven, seven minutes. Seven minutes. Seven minutes. So which, which do you want, guys? Did you want to go into data, wasn't it? Well, the one yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the, the measuring and recording, that one, yeah. correct? Yeah. Happy? Yeah. Okay, measuring and recording coatings, this is our bit, I guess. Yeah. Application management and testing. Um, what are you doing? You're gathering product information, paint application schedules, measuring and recording, and, and possibly testing. What do I mean by that? It's great that you're recording everything, but you don't, if you don't have any batch numbers on there, then you know, you need, you need every bit of information you can because the products that we deal with will have batch numbers. Not your responsibility to get them, but someone needs to get that for you. So, you know, for, from, a, from a paint company's point of view, if there was a problem with the paint, and you know, the, the world isn't perfect. Sometimes you may have a problem with the paint. We would want to kill that batch of paint before it goes anywhere else. So batch number recording, all those things are really, really useful. Also, it's interesting to know, and it's not just Axe and Noble. Um, I know that all the other paint companies do it. They, they keep surplus of their stock. They'll have a quarter of everything that they make for testing. So they're able to test the product for you. So if you're, if you're looking at, a, what can we say, tank coating. We've done a epoxy tank coating, and the, the surface is sticky. It's probably aiming blue, but, you know, you, you want to check that the paint's good, that it's curing properly. So you can talk to the paint company and they can try, try their tests and make sure that everything's okay. But those batch numbers are really, really important on that. Um, what are we recording? We're recording um, on the paint application, the mix ratio, this is what we want from the painters, um, the, the pop life. We, when we talk about pop life, uh, there's two things here, because people think pop life is, is when until the paint goes really jelly-like, but actually the paint will go off a lot sooner than that. Um, and you're, it's normally when, the, the, when you put it through maybe a dim four cup or something like that, where the viscosity doubles. If you, if you have that as a rough rule of thumb, if the viscosity is doubled from, from start to finish, that's it's at the end of its pop life. And that can then give you issues with flow and how the product's gonna look. But you need to record all of these sort of things. Um, why, why do you do that? There's a lot of th these things that are out of all of our control when we're surveying and looking at vessels. You can't, you're not the paint expert in application, you're not the paint manufacturer, but all of these, there are so many variations that can cause issues. It can be what I call pilot error, it can be painter, it can be product, it can be environment, it can be substrate. There are so many things that you need to have an awareness of and, and record. So the, the data collection is pretty well everything you come across. So it's very important to use a form and, and make that reproducible. And to make yourself known, you know, give, give it your, whether it's your company logo or the, the way you look at it. But if you use a form, you know where to look every time. I don't know if that makes sense, but you've seen some of the reports that you get 50 pages long. People don't read 50 pages. Put your executive summary at the beginning with a reference to what part of the report they need to, because I can assure you that no one will read that 50 page report until, until the, you know, what hits the fan. So, you know, executive summary at the beginning with a reference point to any, any concerns you may have, is probably the most powerful thing in the report. Record everything, but just make that first executive summary the thing that tells everything on there. Coating diary, it's really important. You want the, the paint companies to have a coating diary. You want to know uh, what they did, when they did it, how they did it. Very, very simple stuff, um, but it's really useful for you in, in building 
it's, if there's an issue, it's going to come back to you as the coating surveyor because they're going to say, well, actually, you, you, sign, you sign this on as conforming to spec. Yeah, conforming to spec because I was checking dry film thickness. But the, the cause of the failure may, may have been something else. You just need to make sure that you've got all the correct information on there. Um, testing equipment, obviously one of the main things, we've talked a lot about ambient conditions today with uh, corrosion, those sort of things, but that's really, really important. Um, surface preparation, again, you know, that's the key thing, isn't it? If I, if I got you to, uh, I, don't, I don't know if any of you have seen these climbing walls that you can climb up, and if I put a rucksack on your back and I get you to go up the climbing wall, you'll, you'll go up the climbing wall. If I start putting rocks in the back of that, at some point you're going to fall off is you're, you're going to lose your, your grip. You're going to lose your mechanical adhesion. There's only two ways to make paint stick. One's mechanically, the other one's chemically. So you need to make sure that your anchor that you're starting with is the right profile to go through the skin that you're doing. Does that make sense? There's going to be a point when people recoat, recoat, and recoat, but it's going to, you see it where it just, it's going to fail because that original surface prep was only meant for maybe a couple of coats of paint. So you need to be mindful of that if you get involved with maintenance and repair, that actually the underlying substrate is strong enough to take another, another scheme of paint. That's really important. Paint application, uh, what, what do you want to see? I love to see a paint applicator actually with little dots all over his gloves or on his overalls where he's got his wet film gauge, you know. And the worst thing you can give me is a clean document. <laughs> we know if it's a clean document, they've never used it. If it's got a footprint on it and paint all over it and I can only just read it, then that's, that's fine by me. Or um, give them Q panels. See them these Q panels, little metal panels? That's a really good one. Get them to do a Q panel for you. And then you've got, you've got a physical piece of uh, you know, result there that you can have through the, through the stages. Um, Paint testing, oh, we're nearly there, Mike. Uh, we're looking at dry, we can check dry film thickness. You've probably seen all the equipment. You've got non-destructive, which is um, using uh, a gel and a, it's a bit like when you, your wife goes for a pregnancy and they're checking for the baby, you can use ultrasound. Um, or a, a, pig, a pig is a paint inspection gauge, that, but that's destructive. This is where it's really difficult for you as an inspector, but it's like, what do you want me to do? Because, you know, if I do it, it's going to be destructive. Um, the other thing is, is to work back from the wet goods put on there. If you look at the um, surface area sprayed to the, the product being applied, then you can give, have an idea of how much paint has been applied. But it's, it's really hard for you sometimes as a surveyor to say exactly what's on there. Um, we're, we're looking at all sorts. We've got down here, uh, we can check filler hardness. So that the brave gauge at the bottom here, that will, it's just a pin in the bottom that will check the filler hardness, the short D. Um, that just makes sure that the filler's gone off before you start going through the next scheme. That's important as well, that you need to make sure it's lost all its solvents and evidence come out of the filler. Uh, gloss, that's right at the end of the project. Um, microscope may sound strange, but, but really, really useful. Sometimes you might Oh, I don't know, this makes me nervous. Some, some surveyors with microscopes are dangerous, but it's a good piece of equipment to have. You know, it might be that there's a pinhole and you just want to check that it's not, it's only in the top coat and not through to substrate. It, you know, that, it might result in it just needs a, it's in an inconspicuous area, a touch of paint and don't worry about it, or it might be that it goes back down to substrate and it's going to cause you a corrosion issue. You know, in a tank, that's an issue, a pinhole. Uh, in, in other areas, it may not be. We haven't talked about it, but while we're on this, we have high and low visibility areas as well. And that's a good one to define what's a high and what's a low visibility area. Um, adhesion testing, that, that's a, a strong one for me. I think before you start to do any maintenance or refit, you need to make sure what's on there is strong enough to take another scheme. So you can, there's many ways you can test that. Uh, the top one is actually, just looks like sellotape. If you can just, um, you, you do a crosshatch cut with a standing blade, or there's a tool that's segregated. I think there's six blades, and you do a crosshatch cut, put the tape on it, and pull it off. And depending on how much product peels off, depends you how tells you how strong the bond is. Uh, probably the, the one that's a, a little bit uh, 
more precise would be the, uh, the dolly, the pull-off one that you're seeing at the bottom. Uh, Mike does run, I think you run, um, you're doing that thing later in the year, aren't you, on equipment? And... Yeah, um, we're looking forward to that. It's on the uh, 13th of November in Portsmouth. Yeah, I've got a colleague yeah. that's going to do well, that, yeah. that goes through the equipment yeah. and how it, how it works. But I guess my closing comment, gentlemen, is, is as a paint surveyor, deal with the fact. Um, stick to the process. Everything, I think we've learned today that there is a process in everything we do, and we hate to admit it, all of us, because we, we all hate process. But there is an element of process in everything that we do. Um, if, you, if you have a form that works for you, use it and, and keep that form. It's almost like a prompt sheet. So when your car goes in for a service, you get your, your service sheet back that they've got your, they've done your tire pressures, they check that your lights work, they, and they tick the box of everything that's relevant. And it's pretty well like that. Once you've found the form that works for you, um, and I know through RMCI, they, they have a, a way of laying out the form, it, it makes sure that you cover every aspect. So be involved right from the start. Manage the expectation. Be very clear on your whole points, the points that you're going to expect. And keep it as fact. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.